So just to kind of introduce maybe on a maybe lighthearted way uh, to tell you a little story. And maybe I've shared this story before, but you have to excuse me again because priests, we share stories a lot. So I forget who I've told what sometimes. So I, in my time in UVA, I did a study abroad program and that was my first time going to Europe and it was in Spain and it was for four months, which at the time felt like a really long time. So before I was leaving, I was actually getting really nervous to leave home and just kind of see what a new world was going to be like. And I wasn't not going to go, but I was just getting really nervous about it. It's like kind of like everything to be planned out and so forth. But the program, we were going to meet in New York at JFK with other people from other places in the country and then fly over as a group from there to Madrid. And that, so I just bought a ticket to go from Dulles to JFK. And so the flight, I think, was like 6 p.m. out of JFK. So you just had to get there kind of before then. So I bought this ticket for I thought it was like 9.30 in the morning out of Dulles and go to check in. And they're like, you have a 9.30 p.m. flight. And I thought, oh, no. Um, I'm like, I'm ruined. I can't go. And they're like, no, we'll, we'll fix this somehow. Uh, this is actually when airlines were still actually accommodating to you. And <laughs> so they actually did put me on another flight, but out of Reagan. So fortunately, my dad is a very um, patient person. And he drove me from Dulles to Reagan and dropped me off and flew up there. And he thought, like, I thought, OK, crisis averted. And I met some other people who were going on that trip and sort of started settling a little bit, but not for too long because, of course, JFK is a monster airport. It's not easy to move around, especially with four months worth of stuff. You're kind of we wheeling. And then I find out when we get there that the flight's delayed for a few hours. And I'm like, OK, well, it's not the end of the world, but at least we're going. And just then leave around like 9 o'clock. And they think they gave us a voucher you know, for know, like $3 or something, which doesn't get you much in New York. But anyway, so we start to board around 9. And by this time, I'm really tired because I got up I don't know, like at five o'clock or whatever. And, you know, boarding international flights takes a long time and they're starting to like jabber away in Spanish and I don't understand them and you don't really know anybody still. Then you get on the plane and find out there's some mechanical issues, um, which makes anyone feel nervous. And it starts to delay a little bit and, you know, it's late and it's Delaying a little bit more, and then eventually they start to serve us dinner, and we're still just sitting there parked, um, and you know that's never good. So we're eating, you know, the delicious food and uh, kind of just getting by. And I think at some point I fell asleep because I was just so tired. But then I wake up to like people kind of yelling because um, they're basically like, "I want off this plane. Like I don't want to be on this plane. I've been here for like three hours, and like I don't want to crash and die in the Atlantic." And um, I'm like, I don't want to do that either. Um, maybe I want off this thing. So eventually, I think it's around like 1 o'clock in the morning, and they announce, OK, we're all set. We're going to take off after four hours of sitting there. And they say, oh, it's January, and we forgot to de-ice the engine. So we have to wait a little while. So you're like, oh, great. So we actually left it at 2 o'clock. And uh, but it's at that point, I, th I thought, you know, um, I was thinking about all my friends back in Charlottesville. I was thinking about leaving home for four months, all this stuff. And I thought, maybe I'm making a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should get off this plane. Um, I don't think I could have, but I honestly wanted to. And in a sense, maybe you're thinking that too here. You're like, maybe I'm making a mistake in, in coming here tonight. That, or even exploring the Catholic faith. You're like, there's kind of a lot going on. Maybe ran into traffic here. Maybe you just kind of walk into the room and you think, like, I don't know anybody. This is, you know, like, why, why did I come? Now, the answer, of course, is, I mean, God brought you here. And what I did learn from that experience was, this is, I mean, the Catholic faith is sort of like going to a foreign country, too, where uh, if you've ever been to a Catholic mass and you don't really know what's going on, you, you feel like you, you really are a foreigner where everyone is standing up, sitting down, kneeling, saying things at different times in ways that don't really sound normal. Um, everyone else is speaking in unison. Uh, then at different times, they talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. Um, 
and then this guy wearing these robes comes out called the priest and you know people are singing and you really have like no idea what's going on and you can feel a little bit you know lost even just with the vocabulary and i think that really is sort of akin to going to a foreign country so this i consider a little bit like you you should kind of come to the the airport tonight and you know we've sort of advertised a little bit we have this international flight going to catholic land i guess um and if you want to get on board i mean actually the tickets are free so but you're not obligated to come i mean unlike that airplane that i was on you can you can get off at any time so really the six months process is about getting you ready to if you are ready to kind of land and start living a catholic life beginning at easter i mean it really begins now but in earnest in a certain way that's when it's really gonna and the rubber hits the road now what i also did take away from that little story was um you know that was a great experience i had there those four months and it really actually helped clarify in my mind a little bit about what i thought was god was calling me to do which was uh, to become a priest now of course um when i came back home i told myself that was just you know in europe that didn't count I tried to say that maybe i shouldn't become a priest but that's a different story but it really helped prepare me for things that would come later and i think that's what this is hopefully doing for you tonight that this is going to prepare the road for your faith life as, as you move along in ways you can't even anticipate so i didn't of course know this at the time but just a couple years later um i i was very privileged to do most of my seminary studies in italy and instead of going there for four months i was asked to go there for four years and I don't think I could have done that without that prior four-month endeavor because it just gave me the confidence to know, like, maybe I, can, maybe I can make it. Now, again, four months felt, like, overwhelming. I didn't come home for two years at one point. So that I couldn't have done, I think, without that little um, an initial, like, fudge or something. So fortunately, God, I think, sees the bigger picture for so many things, and he's done that, I'm sure, with your lives, and you can think of different events and activities that have happened that maybe even have brought you here. Regardless, you are here, so let's take a look at maybe what this next six months is going to kind of look like. Just to go over kind of the calendar, some of you um, may have already seen this online or picked up a copy over on the side table over there. We're going to just pause for a second as we... Uh, maybe get some calendars out. The uh, Monday lectures, no one's ever required to come to anything, first of all. Like you're here because you, you want to be here. Uh, so you don't, have to come, you don't ever have to come to anything, but we're going to talk about why it is important to come and why we even bother doing this. So Monday evenings, pretty much every Monday from now until Easter, we have our RCI session, 7.30 to 9 o'clock, right here in this room. We normally aren't, uh, we don't like to have snacks and food, but um, not like a full dinner plate. So um, if you come one time and you're looking for dinner and it's not here, I hope that you're not too disappointed. Um, now that we could ask, like, why do we have to do this together? Wouldn't it be easier to, especially in today's age, that you could just watch a bunch of videos? There's a lot of great books out there to read. In fact, you would probably learn more from other people, like online or from different books, than you would be listening to me. Uh, that's not just me being like, you know, humble or something. That's the honest truth. But there's something about coming together as a group that changes the way that you approach this process. First of all, if you did this just by yourself, the obvious question would become like, well, how do you know that you're even doing it right? Uh, I mean, who's to kind of like guide you? It's nice to have people that kind of affirm you and you show up to something and a priest is there. Well, I mean, it must be not that far off or at least somewhat on track of where I am trying to get. So there's kind of a nice, uh, you know, check and balance there. But also there's something about coming together for each of you that brings you together here as a little more intentional way. For example, if I said, why don't you just go home and read 50 pages each week? 
you'd say, sure, and maybe you do that the first week, the second week, you only read 25, and the third week, you put the book down forever. Um, I mean, that happens all the time, and I know it because I do it. You know, sometimes our best laid plans, you know, when you say, I'm gonna develop a routine of exercise, or prayer, or, you know, whatever it is, eating healthy, and it lasts for a little while, but it's, it's difficult to kind of keep it up. Coming here, though, as a group, it's sort of like, okay, I, I actually can know I like, dedicate time each week to learning more about my faith and you know, the bigger questions in life. But then finally, the other reason to come together is the church, uh, maybe in spite of what you've heard, is actually a community. It's a 1.2 billion member community, but it's still a community. And heaven is not meant to be something of just like me and God or you and God. It's like all of us in God, that God's project to bring us all to heaven is meant to be something that's done together. It's, uh, God didn't have to make us into like, gather us into like a big group, but he does. And not all of us are perfect. We all have our limitations and we also have our gifts to offer and to share. And you may uh, notice here that people are at different stages in their lives. Here tonight, some are married, some are single, some you know, are relatively young, some are more middle-aged or you know, at a different point in life. Some are probably very successful in some professional way. Maybe uh, you know, others have had more like, you know, um, like a humble or just you know, modest you know, career. Some have lived here their whole lives, some have lived in different places. Uh, some have been very involved perhaps in another faith practice. Some have maybe have never been involved with something formally. Whatever the case is, you all have something to offer and to kind of share with someone else, and that's hopefully what we accomplish too. So while the primary function of Mondays is like the intellectual growth that uh, I hope that you get out of this, it's also the, I think, the social component of it too, that coming together and just seeing people, and then some of the other activities that we'll be doing too, I hope, foster and you know, complement what takes place just on Monday evenings. So just to let you know, we are, as I already said, we are recording these things to put on the website so you can, if this is so enthralling, you can listen to me anytime you want. Uh, I'd be kind of amazed if you did that. But it's also in case you, you, I know you can't come to every session. Let's be honest, people have lives. I know you have activities, a lot of you have kids. And it could be that you happen to notice that Father Barnes is presenting one week and your kids are also conveniently sick. You're like, oh, I couldn't make it. Um, you know, but you're like, oh, but one of the other priests is presenting, oh, my kids are doing just fine. So that, that definitely happens as well. But if you can't come one time, we're, that's why we put these things online so you can follow. Sometimes you have, maybe you have to travel or something. But if you can try to make it like a point to come here on Mondays, that would be, you know, wonderful. I think a great you know, way just to cons consistently foster your, your efforts here to try to learn more about just the Catholic faith and try to learn um, what God is calling you to. One of the things we'll use primarily as a resource is called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this is uh, a book we'll uh, offer to you tonight along with, uh, with a Bible. But this catechism is, it's, kind of a fancy word for uh, essentially all the teachings of the Catholic Church in one relatively uh, brief book. It's jam-packed. It's not something that you would probably like to read from cover to cover. It would probably make you fall asleep at some point. So it's meant to be actually just a resource that you read, you know, bit by bit. And we associate the topics of each week with aspects from you know, that particular section in the catechism. But if you're ever just curious about something, like, I wonder what the Catholic Church says about topic whatever, going to Mass on Sunday, um, the third commandment of the Ten Commandments, what the Church, you know, thinks about the environment, uh, just something like that, you can actually start to find the answers in there. So it's pretty convenient for wondering things, and I would recommend using that instead of, like, Wikipedia. Um, as a more like authentic teaching method. In addition to the Monday evenings, which you might have noticed on the schedule, there's some supplemental events, which were kind of 
testing out this year to see how it goes. These things, again, you're not required to come to them. There's something that if you're looking for a little more, if you're looking maybe to go a little deeper, that's what they're there for. I, I recommend them strongly because I think that they will be very beneficial to you all. But, you know, I understand that you got lives and you sometimes you have competing obligations, so don't feel guilty if you just can't make it. But the goals that we're trying to help you do here through this little six month project are to grow intellectually, which you will give you these resources to read at home. You have the presentations on Monday evenings. And then of course, anything else that you happen to kind of stumble upon or you know, um, just piques your interest, that's all you know, wonderful and okay. So we want you to grow intellectually, but we also want you to grow spiritually, where I hope that in some sense, obviously you're already hearing God's voice or you wouldn't be here. You may not think you're hearing his voice very clearly, but we'll try to help you with that project. So prayer is also an important part of this because if you're open to God's will in your life, you should be you know, praying about it and asking that he gives you the strength just to know it and to guide you in the way that he wants to guide you. He obviously cares about us. He wants us to know kind of where he wants us to be in life. So if you're not feeling quite certain or you're feeling great about being here, uh, God's you know, definitely certainly involved in you know, how you're, uh, I guess, soaking this in, for lack of a better word. But then finally, uh, there's also a human side of things. You know, we're not uh, a bunch of machines or robots. Like, we all have a need to, I think, grow together, but in like a human way. So that's why we have these social events too. So hopefully these kind of, I don't know what else to call them other than like kind of recommended or supplemental things, encourage, you know, those things you know, to different degrees. So tonight was a little bit of just a social thing. And we kind of had to try to do that about once a month. So it's not overwhelming, but it's at least regular enough to where it contributes to this process. In October, just on a Sunday afternoon, I know it's during football, but, um, you know, just may miss the first quarter or something of the four o'clock game. We'll just uh, maybe meet and talk about some of the readings that uh, we use during Catholic, during a Sunday Mass for Catholics. So maybe kind of even how we get those readings, talk about how the priest even maybe kind of formulates a homily out of it, uh, even kind of just read through them and see what your thoughts are for the week about that. Like if you were just to glance at that, what are your reactions? What questions do you have? And so it would really just be um, kind of an informal discussion, uh, some like food and time for social. So it's really just a, We'll just try this for an hour and just see how it goes. For November, we'll do kind of a similar thing, but we'll just review some of the topics that we've gone over so far at that point as a way to kind of check in. And if there's something you want to go in a little bit deeper, if there's something you just want to review again, uh, just ask some questions. I mean, wherever the topic or the discussion kind of goes to that point. So I hope that that also, those two are a little more intellectually um, framed or just offering that opportunity. For December, uh, we'll do something a little more just socially based where uh, prior to Christmas, so I mean, unlike the rest of the world, we start Christmas on Christmas Day. So before Christmas, which I know everybody colloquially just calls it the Christmas season, but uh, for Catholics, we actually have a season before Christmas. So we'll uh, do this, what we call like an Advent or pre-Christmas little party. And we'll do that a couple weeks before Christmas, also on a Sunday. And that's just a, uh, we actually did it last year and people uh, didn't complain. So we'll do it again. In January, we'll do something that's a little more spiritually based where we'll take, it'll be on a Saturday and we'll take a little pilgrimage to the National Shrine uh, in Washington, DC. So it's actually the, the largest Catholic church in North America. It's the eighth largest church in, well, I guess the universe or the planet. And it's a kind of a, a wonderful chance just to check that out, see, I think, the interesting history behind it. We take a tour, we have mass there, and some other like spiritual talks. And so it's, it's a wonderful day as well that people have really valued in the past. And at St. Mary's, we've been doing this for, well, I mean, since the beginning of time, I guess, or 
at least as long as I'm, I'm aware of, back to like the early 2000s. In February, uh, we'll kind of explain where this fits in too, but after one of the Sunday Masses, which we'll encourage you to go to as a group, um, you have the opportunity maybe to just go out for brunch and, and enjoy each other's company after that. Again, that's just a little more social, but uh, just something that's purely optional if uh, you know, that definitely interests you. And then finally in March, after the Easter Vigil Mass, which is kind of the, the culmination of things, that's where we're, we're headed if you're uh, seeking to um, be baptized, be confirmed, receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church. That's um, where that takes place. And then we have a, a kind of a celebration afterwards. Then finally in April, the event we'll do is to hopefully integrate you all a little bit. We're trying to do this all along, but in a little more concentrated way into some of the activities in life of the parish, which there's a lot of different activities that go on. Some of you I know are even involved with them, which is wonderful. But this, is a, this will be a chance to meet some of the persons who coordinate some of these things, maybe see if that interests you. But if nothing else, it'll just give you a sense of like, there's a lot that goes on here and you may not want to do any of it, but at least you kind of get a little more familiarity with things. So uh, hopefully all these things will uh, taken together add a lot to what we discuss on Monday nights. But again, if you're only going to come to some stuff, I would say that the Monday night stuff is the primary, like most important stuff. But as you'll kind of see, we have so much material to cover that it's really not uh, the most conducive to just sitting around and like talking about sports. You know, we obviously always have time for like, you know, questions and stuff, but uh, you know, that's where these other things will start to, I think, fill in the gaps a little bit. Uh, maybe we can talk about requirements here. So what is required of you to actually go through with this or to, to participate? I mean, first of all, anyone is welcome to, to, to come who is just seeking to know about the Catholic faith. You don't have to be certain that you want to do this by any means. You don't have to um, have any great background either. It's just, if you want to be here, you're welcome to be here. And no point are you really like bound like into this. Are you committed to anything? Sometimes people do participate in this process and then for different reasons decide to postpone or you know maybe even put off for a while actually becoming Catholic. And that's fine. It's not a race. It's about doing things in a way that you actually feel comfortable to hear God's voice but then respond to it in confidence. So We'd love for you to be ready to do that in an Easter 2016, but you know, God has his own timetable sometimes. So basically all that's required of you is to have an open heart. If uh, your heart is open to just listening to what we have to offer, to hearing God's voice, then I think that you will get a lot out of this. If your heart's not open, then it's really difficult to, I think, appreciate what might God have in, in store for you. Uh, sometimes uh, people want to know about, you know, baptism and stuff. So one of the requirements that we need to, of course, be sure about with all of you is just your baptism status. Some of you, you know that you've never been baptized, and so that you're like, well, that makes it pretty easy. Then we'll just kind of take care of everything we need to do all at once. But if you have been baptized, sometimes there's a question of, does this baptism count in the Catholic Church, or uh, is it accepted? Many baptisms out there in Protestant communities are most definitely accepted and count. So therefore, we don't baptize anybody a second time. Uh, I actually wrote this like 70-page paper about why we don't do that. So I can certainly um, tell you why we don't do that. But your baptism certainly counts. It's as good and effective as a Catholic baptism. It's just that in other Protestant faiths, we don't share the sacraments beyond baptism, typically, to the same degree. So that's one thing we want to um, just get down for sure is your, is your baptism status. And if you have been baptized, if you've been baptized Catholic, then we need to have a record of your Catholic baptism, wherever that happened, whatever parish that was, uh, as part of like our paperwork here. And if you've been baptized as a Protestant, we just need some copy of some record beyond like a napkin that you, that you were baptized. Um, so something that's a little more official than just like, yeah, I was baptized. Um, 
Like that's enough to prove to us that, that you actually were. Just out of curiosity, in case you're wondering, the two requirements for a valid baptism are you had to be baptized in water, so if it was some other liquid, it didn't count, and you had to be baptized in the name of God as the Trinity, so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you're baptized in some other names, um, yeah, that didn't count either. So uh, th those are the two requirements for like a valid baptism. Sometimes there's also questions about, about marriages. So I just, that can get a little complicated, and I don't want to make um, anybody too confused. But, so if, you've been, if you are married or you've been previously married, sometimes that can present some uh, stuff to consider as one is becoming Catholic. So if you're going to become Catholic, especially at Easter this year, we want to make sure that if you are married that you're in a marriage that is recognized by the Catholic Church. And so if, it just depends on the particulars in that case. If you're not currently married to anybody, well, then it's not going to present a big issue. But if you, for example, are divorced from you know, a previous marriage and you're seeking or you're hoping to get married to someone else, then that's something else we have to kind of you know, talk about to make sure that you do it in a way that uh, certainly is in correspondence with the Catholic teaching on marriage. So that's another important question too, that sometimes that could even present a little delay uh, as far as becoming like fully initiated in the Catholic Church if there was you know, some like, you know, marriage issue there. Um, part of it, I mean, we'll talk more about this, but we believe in the indissolubility of marriage. So I know it gets a little complicated and it's not worth going into tonight, but I just only raise that just in case that's sort of, you know, like part of your background and, you know, uh, we just aren't going to ignore it. That's all. It's, we certainly appreciate everything that's happened in your life up until this point, And that's why I mean, your marriage is a big thing. And so that's why we certainly include that as part of this process of converting to the Catholic faith. There could be some other obstacles that are present in your life to maybe going through with this. So that's something else, too, that we try to um, understand. You know, I'm in a particular way, trying to be attentive to any of those things for you all. So we just want to keep in mind that uh, it's not that there's anything that we don't, it's not that we don't want you to become Catholic or um, whatever else, but sometimes there can just be certain things we need to like kind of resolve in order to kind of smooth the path over. And, you know, for most people, it's really not, there's really not too much to do, but just in case there is something, it doesn't mean there's something is wrong with you or that you're less desirable or less good. It just means that um, there's just kind of an additional step we need to, to do to make this uh, the most effective and the most like you know, meaningful to you. Uh, finally, there's another thing about sponsors, which um, maybe you're already familiar with. Maybe you have a sponsor in mind. Maybe you have no idea what a sponsor is and you're panicking. A sponsor is someone that you're going through this process and I hope that you feel like supported by myself and the other kind of RCI volunteer team who is present. But a sponsor is someone who in a particular way kind of takes on the responsibility of being like your mentor, your guide, uh, I want to say just someone in a, is a good support for you. It could be some of you are married to someone who's Catholic and so it could be you know that person. You're like, yeah, my husband, my wife, that's who I want to be my sponsor. Maybe you have a close friend who uh, is kind of encouraged you to be here and that person fits that role really well or other family member. Maybe you don't know anybody who might fill that role and that's fine. We will help you find someone at the right time. The choice is up to you. So uh, if I said like, um, okay, why don't you take on you know this person to be your sponsor and and you have no choice, you must take this person. Okay, that's not how sponsors work. We might suggest someone to you, might introduce you to somebody, but it's up to you. Um, and you can feel free to say no. Like, no, I don't want that person. Uh, I, I want someone better. Uh, another motivation behind the sponsors, though, is this person really should be a good role model in the faith. It, it makes sense because this is someone who stands up and of everyone in a sense like during the time where you become Catholic 
and usually that person has his or her hand on your shoulder even. So it's, it's a very significant and important act. And so we want to make sure that this person is someone who is actually, you know, I think suitable for that role. It would not be fair to actually ask somebody who is really, you know, not in a sense, it's not about being qualified, but sometimes there's persons who are not married in the Catholic Church. They're Catholic, but they're kind of married outside the church or they're perhaps just really not practicing. I'm not talking about being, okay, none of us is perfect and we all have our faults and failings, but if you're just starting making an effort to go to Mass on Sunday, that person may not be the best um, you know, sponsor for you because we don't want you to kind of follow that example of um, maybe not going to Mass on Sundays. We'd like you to hopefully have a sponsor who will uh, support you and train you to kind of, you know, hopefully follow a good example. So that's really the requirements behind a sponsor. And so there's actually, we have to get, uh, if we don't know who your sponsor is, if your sponsor is someone here from St. Mary's, um, for example, if, if I were your sponsor, well then I will accept the fact that I'm suitable to be your sponsor. Um, or if you pick someone else like in this room or whatever, okay, we know who these people are. If you pick someone to be your sponsor from like California, well, I have no idea who that person is. And so we need to have some sort of letter of like eligibility from where that person is from. Uh, not to confuse you, even more, but your sponsor doesn't have to be physically present at like this ceremony where, we, where you become Catholic. The person could be living in another part of the country and unable to attend. But if you want that person to be your sponsor, that person could still fill that role. More on that later, but that's hopefully just gives you a little uh, better feel for it now. Finally, um, or not finally, still a lot left to do, but there's this thing called um, scrutinies that we do as part of these, uh, uh, during Sunday masses, it'll be uh, kind of in the middle of winter here, right before the last you know, few weeks really get going. And it sounds kind of intimidating, the word scrutiny, but really if you think about it in a positive way, it's like kind of scrutinizing like your decision, scrutinizing this process where we're just making sure that it's uh, going in the way that we want it to. So that's, it's kind of more of a personal milestone. It's like, this is a chance for you to, you know, I think reflect on things a little more deeply. You don't have to come to these scrutiny masses, but they're, I think part of this process and certainly kind of show you like, okay, you're being slowly like integrated fully into like the Catholic liturgy or our Catholic mass on Sunday. So if you don't come to them, uh, this, that doesn't mean you can't become Catholic. It just is another opportunity to see and experience that. So if you see that on the calendar later on and you're wondering what that is, that's very briefly what that is, but we'll talk more about it as, as it comes you know, closer. In March, we do this thing with an interview where, like you're not, you're gonna have to talk to a priest. Um, I apologize for that. So an interview is a strong word, but I don't know of a better word to use. It's not a job interview. Okay, you're not interviewing, I'm not going to interview you see, like, can you become Catholic? Like, tell me your best qualities. Um, like, do you work well as a teacher? Uh, things like that. That's not what we're doing in these interviews. They're really, like, it's uh, just a last chance to make sure that everything is okay, that you're okay with this. Uh, if you have some, like, burning question that is really bothering you, like, I have to know the answer to this. Um, if that's the case, go talk to, like, Father Hathaway, not me. Um, but if there's just something you know that hasn't quite gotten resolved yet, as I kind of mentioned with like marriage stuff or whatever, that's, we want to make sure that we catch anything that, um, that should be caught. And so that's really just like, okay, let's make sure everything is okay before we actually go through with this. Um, then there's Holy Week, which is the most significant, most special week that we have in the Catholic Church that you're invited to participate in any of the like parish activities that we have that week. And it culminates with our Easter celebration. And so there's um, the Easter Vigil Mass on Saturday night. I think it's, it's March 27, unless I'm uh, forgetting. So instead of uh, going to Easter Sunday Mass, which maybe you're accustomed to, or celebrating Easter on Sunday, you think, why are we doing this on a Saturday? Well, it's, um, it makes sense in the context of like Holy Week that's like, the third day, like, um, you know, so to speak. This is 
Jesus like rising from the tomb in kind of the darkness of the night. And that's why we do this mass like after the sun is set. Uh, we also do a rehearsal that morning, um, which we require you to attend because the rehearsal it goes over like how things are gonna work during that mass. And as you all know, if you rehearse something, it goes better during it. Uh, you know, it's really to everyone's benefit that we kind of show up there and we just walk through everything. It's not complicated, uh, unless you're the priest celebrant, then it's very complicated. But, uh, but for you all, you pretty much just kind of show up, but it's just to make you feel comfortable and I think to appreciate what is actually like happening so you're not like, oh, they poured water on me, why was that? Um, you know, just some basic things like that. Okay, the last thing I wanted to cover is that Catholicism is, is a lifelong project. We're engaging this in a very intense way for six months, but six months is, it's a short period of time. We can't cover everything, and if you just said, I'm just gonna come here and learn for six months, and my learning will stop for the rest of my life, then you're actually kind of depriving yourself because things really get gleaned over a long period of time. As I mentioned, kind of like if you were going to a foreign country and you're learning about the customs, the language, all these little things, it's only over like the very subtle things that you pick up over time that you begin to appreciate the depth, the meaning, the beauty of it. And it's the same thing, in fact, even more so with the Catholic Church. So by kind of starting this, this is a very intense like, you know, study program, but this is not the conclusion of it. So I don't want anybody to view this like, once I get to Easter, I'm all done, because you're really not done. There's so much more left to do. That's true for me as a priest, by the way. If um, you ever feel like you've arrived in the Catholic faith, in a sense, or like, I've arrived, I got everything down, then maybe you need to take a second look at it again, and think maybe there's still something left that you can work on, and it's still something that you can learn, because we're talking about God who is infinite. So. This whole thing of learning about God is an infinite thing. Catholicism is also a lifelong project because I really could sum it up in two ways. The Catholic faith is learning about God, it's learning about ourselves. That's really all it is. It's we come to know more deeply about who God is, but we also learn who we are in light of who God is. And that's an ongoing thing. Like, I mean, have you ever really mastered yourself and know everything there is to know about yourself? That's why it is a lifelong project because you're continuing to learn more about who you are, but not just looking at yourself in your own eyes, but now looking at you through the eyes of God in the person of Jesus, and that changes everything. Just to give a little perspective on six months, it is a really short period of time. I mean, six months is a baseball season or an NFL season. I mean, people have their driver's permit for longer periods of time than six months. So you spend, what, six months learning how to drive? I mean, th this is so much more important than even driving because all we're gonna talk about here are the biggest questions in life. Nothing too overwhelming. Uh, who God is, you know, who, what's the meaning of life? How do we get to heaven? Is there a heaven? Uh, who else is there? Um, if you don't go to heaven, where would you go? Uh, all these sorts of things. These are kind of important, like eternal questions that everyone in like the history of everyone in the world has at least thought about or wondered about. So you're normal if you thought about it in some sense. And maybe you already have a pretty good understanding of things. Maybe this is gonna help clarify some of those bigger questions for you. Regardless, that's why this is a pretty big like undertaking what we're doing. It's achievable, it's doable, but let's just keep that in mind that this is, I mean, but what's more important than trying to figure these things out? And if we're gonna dedicate at least a little bit of time to like, you know, uh, baseball or football or learning how to drive or one semester of, you know, kind of college study or whatever, I think we can dedicate a little bit of time to something like this too. Now, we're gonna move from topics which are a little bit more general in nature. Next week will be kind of about just faith, belief, use of our reason. Then we go into like kind of how God has worked throughout the history of the world, 
who God is, and we'll kind of break that down from just God, from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and saints, um, you know, heaven and hell, these sorts of questions. Then we start to get into what we call the sacraments of the church, where there are seven, and these seven sacraments are the, um, the certain like guaranteed ways that we have of knowing that God has operated in some way in our, uh, like on, on our soul. Some ways we are so certain of their action that we, or we're always certain of their action, I should say, but we don't even repeat them because they don't need to be repeated. That's how powerful an effect they have on our souls, that they leave a mark there that never goes away such as baptism and confirmation. Then we get from that to also then some of the moral teachings. So we talk about the Ten Commandments and some other things that, I mean, let's be honest here, that most people are probably going to disagree with in the world, but that's not what the Catholic Church offers as the truth. So we might hit a topic that could be a little controversial or hard-hitting, and we d I don't want you to feel like this is something that's going to come out of nowhere, at least. It's not that we're going to talk about this stuff all the time, but um, at the end of the day, we're trying to get you to intellectually feel like, yeah, I can believe what the church is teaching about you know, these certain things. You may not be there yet, and it may take a long time, but if you're open to at least learning, then you're definitely in the right place. The topics could be something like abortion or contraception or the indissolubility of marriage, same-sex marriage, even talking about like the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, going to confession with the priest, the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, the role of the communion of saints in heaven, things even such as like just the teachings on the ch like adultery or you know um, relationships prior to marriage, sanctity of life in all its forms and stages. So that's. This is not even the full picture, but those are just some of the things that we kind of have to, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't at least discuss how that fits into the Catholic understanding of a, a proper moral life. Now with all that stuff, Mondays are not really intended to be like a debate session. So if you really are um, unsettled by something or you don't really like what we're offering here or whatever else, I mean, th that's fine in the sense that, like, you're not obligated to accept any of this stuff. But to be respectful of everyone else here who is trying to at least learn and listen. So, you know, certainly sincere questions are you know, always welcome, always a part of the process. Um, but if you want to kind of engage a subject or material in a, in a deeper way, you know, outside of like kind of the, the normal Monday presentations, that's fine and I'd be happy to talk to you, but, you know, just not to, we don't want to, like, have just some raging debate here, because then we kind of get a, a little off track, and it's distracting for other people. That's, it's not really a problem. I don't, I don't foresee that being a problem, but I just wanted to, to let, or make mention of that. Really, Mondays are just also for, like, listening and learning, and so if you're open to that, you might be surprised what God has in store for you. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you may not um, fully understand or appreciate what the church is, is teaching about, even to some of the doctrinal matters and, and stuff like that. Like, if you, at the end of the day, if you don't think that Jesus is God, um, you may not be ready to become Catholic. And that's kind of the, the point. It usually doesn't hold up too many people. But, uh, but there's all sorts of things that really, if that's uh, the... You're just not quite there yet intellectually or in your heart. I mean, that's fine. That's part of the reason why it can take a little longer to um, kind of get, get this stuff out there for you. Really, but all we're going to do is we're not going to offer you easy answers or the popular answers. We're just going to try to offer you the truth. And if, if you're here to, s to seek the truth and to try to understand what God is teaching as the truth and the fact that there even is truth, then, then you've really come to the right place. Catholicism, we b believe and know we have the fullness of the truth because God has, um, and we'll explain how this works, but God has shared it with the church and passed it down throughout the centuries. Doesn't mean that I articulate it perfectly, 
And it doesn't mean that we share it perfectly, but the church as an institution, as a body, as a, as a community, as one communion, it certainly does have it to, to share. There's this uh, passage from the Acts of the Apostles, which you may be familiar with from scripture in the New Testament, where uh, this beggar asked Peter for basically like gold or silver, and Peter's like, I don't know gold and silver, um, but what I do have is Jesus. And you might think like, what, what good is that? I mean, this poor beggar's like, I want food. Uh, but what he's offering this guy is, he's like, look, we don't have a lot of fancy stuff to wow people over. We're, we're not gonna win you over here either just by um, kind of our bling or by like our worldly prestige or our fame or power. The fact is, we're not famous here. We're not powerful. We don't have these worldly allurements when you get right down to it. Uh, but we do have, and all we have to offer is Jesus. And that's what Peter offered, and that's what we have to offer, which is not a small thing. It's a wonderful thing. And that's what I, I hope to share with you all. And I think that the people who've come through our say before found in some way that you know, they could develop a deeper friendship with Jesus in the Catholic Church. And I hope that that is true for you too, because it doesn't matter if you're a priest or you're married or you're single or whatever your state in life is, really all we're trying to do is become better friends with God who also happens to have like a human heart.